the courts allow Tennessee to enforce a pro-life law banning abortions that are sought because of the race, gender, or Down syndrome diagnosis of the child. And the left is furious. Meghan Markle publicly shares her recent miscarriage experience and is comforted by none other than the president of Planned Parenthood. We will examine the schizophrenic logic of abortion rights and take solace in the great conservative consolation. I'm Seth Gruber and this is Unaborted. Well, welcome back to the show, guys. Thank you so much for tuning in and happy Advent as we are now, of course, in the month of December. And these have been strange times. These are unsure times. These are scary times because if you're tuned into the political realities that are facing America writ large, but specifically the pro-life movement and our unborn neighbors, then you know that as we wait around twiddling our thumbs for these lawsuits to figure out who will actually be the president-elect, the fate of our pre-born neighbors hangs in the balance. If the Joe Biden Kamala Harris political ticket enters the White House, we will see unborn children targeted like no other time in American history, and that administration will be to the unborn what Hitler was to the Jews. And if John, Donald Trump loses the White House in December and is not reelected in January, then Georgia will be the state, the battleground state on which the future of this country will be determined. The two Senate runoffs that we talked about recently on this show between uh, uh, Ralph Warnock running against Kelly Loeffler and John um, Ossoff running against David Perdue and we need to maintain those seats if we want to maintain a firm majority in the Senate to keep the possibly most radical Democratic Party ever and most dangerous ticket to the unborn in uh, in check so that they cannot completely end the legislative attempts of the pro-life movement. So we're going to continue covering that stuff. But with all the craziness going on in the country, there's so much more to cover on the state level that uh, we haven't been able to get into recently because of all the um, sort of federal and national news. But first, before we get to that, please scroll down and give the show a rating and review if you haven't done so already. It really helps us reach more people. And I think I told you recently we were in the top uh, 65 of podcasts in the news commentary category for audio podcasts. And that's really great. That's really encouraging. Very few pro-life podcasts will get up there because it's the one issue nobody wants to talk about and certainly not spend their commuting time to actually listen to. So we're reaching more and more people and your help and ratings and reviews actually shoves us up the charts and we show up more uh, when people are perusing and looking for podcasts. So please do that for us. It helps a lot. So Tennessee was recently allowed to enforce their reasons ban on abortion. And this was part of a um, policy or legislation that they put in place actually in the summer that was also going to ban abortion, I believe, after six weeks, um, shortly after there's a detectable heartbeat. But it also enforced banning abortions that are sought because of the race, gender, or Down syndrome diagnosis of the child. And we had talked about this in a recent episode you can go back to called the eugenics of abortion, where we talked about why many re people seek abortions for purely eugenic or racial reasons and how the abortion industry is happy to go along with it with any reason that is provided from a mother or a father as to why they want to kill their children. So according to the Tennessean on November 20th by Mariah Timms reporting, part of a restrictive Tennessee law banning abortions based on gender, race, or prenatal diagnosis of Down syndrome will go into effect after a federal appeals court on Friday, this would be Friday, November 20th, reversed a lower court's decision. The state has asked that so-called reason bans be allowed while litigation continues against a pair of laws Governor Bill Lee signed this summer. The relevant part of the law prohibits abortion depending on the patient's reason for seeking one, specifically limiting the procedure if a doctor knows the patient wishes to terminate the fetus because of a potential Down syndrome diagnosis or its sex or race. Now, the reason why this is significant and important is because this stands in direct opposition to the precedent of Roe versus Wade and Planned Parenthood v. Casey, right? This idea of stare decisis that you probably heard uh, being discussed a lot during the confirmation of Amy Coney Barrett, right? Who was being asked by the left and Democratic politicians how she viewed the idea of um, precedent or stare decisis, and and they're wanting her to say, oh, I'll respect stare decisis, so that so that they'll know, oh, I won't overturn Roe versus Wade, right? But this idea of precedent is that when a when a law or a policy legislation gets ruled on in a certain way by the courts, that ought to be respected in other cases examining similar issues. 
So this stands in direct opposition to the precedent of Roe v. Wade and Planned Parenthood v. Casey, which established that individual states cannot create what they called an undue burden, an undue burden for a woman obtaining an abortion. And it hasn't allowed states to ban abortion before fetal viability. So before the baby can survive outside the womb on its own, the courts have said that states can't pass um, abortion bans before that point. Now, of course, the strange part about all this is that the point of viability continues to change all the time, doesn't it? As medical advancements uh, continue apace and some hospitals pour more talent and time and training into caring for prematurely born babies, the point of viability is completely subjective. It's constantly changing, and it will continue to be moved back at earlier and earlier stages. So who gets to decide the point of fetal viability, right? That's why sometimes you read horror stories in pro-life websites or blogs about families who delivered prematurely born babies or baby, and the doctor did nothing to try to save the baby because that baby was born before their definition, their subjective understanding of when viability is. But states have not been allowed to pass abortion bans before fetal viability. So this could present a possible threat to Roe and Casey and could end up before the Supreme Court. And that's why these state-level attempts to pass pro-life legislation and abortion bans are so important because as the Supreme Court looks more conservative than before, we have a better chance of overturning Roe. Doesn't mean we will. We've been let down before by um, Supreme Court justices that were appointed by a Republican administration and Republican president. But obviously that's better than having four more Ruth Bader Ginsburgs and also is sort of the importance of reelecting President Trump, because we'll get one and maybe two more justices on the court. So that's why these state level attempts are so important, okay, on, on a larger level. Now, Governor Bill Lee came out and said, every life is precious and every child has inherent human dignity. Our laws prohibit abortion based on the race, gender, or diagnosis of Down syndrome of the child. And the court's decision will save lives. Protecting our most vulnerable Tennesseans is worth the fight. Because this legislation doesn't say, oh, you can't get an abortion um, after a Down syndrome diagnosis that you're seeking because the baby got diagnosed with Down syndrome after eight weeks. No, it's just period, period. So that would run counter to the precedent of Roe versus Wade. And the left and abortion crazies is very interesting, right? They, they call conservatives all sorts of nasty names, right? What do they call us? They call us racists and sexists and ableists, you know, because you don't support universal health care. And so people with pre-existing conditions and who struggle with, who, who are infirm or disabled, they're not going to get the high level of healthcare quality that we then the left would give them, right? So they call us ableist, sexist, and racist. This is very funny because their response to this bill has kind of shown their true colors, right? The mask is slipping and they're showing us their racist, eugenicist, and ableist face. Interesting. Of course, everything that the left accuses the right of doing or being tends to actually be an accurate um, picture or portrayal of their actual ideology, right? So I like this bill in Tennessee because it trolls the left. It forces them to answer this question. Is targeting people because of immutable characteristics wrong or not? <laughs> right? If I discriminate against you purely because of your skin color, your religion, your gender, your hair color, your eye color, whatever it is, those things are particularly vile, right? That's bigotry. That's discrimination against someone else based off of characteristics they have no control over. And so the left calls pro-lifers racists because through pro-life legislation, they're hurting, they're hurting women of minorities and black women the most who struggle to get abortions the most or afford to pay for it. So they tell pro-lifers, it's actually through your pro-life legislation that you're showing your racism. Well, let's look at their response to this bill coming out of Tennessee, which says we shouldn't kill unborn humans simply because the parents don't want a female, they don't want a certain racial or mixed racial baby, or they don't want an infirm baby. And predictably, the fetal apologists or pro-choice activists have stuck their head fully in the ground and denied the existence of reality in order to dodge the ideological bullet that this bill represents to their worldview, right? Because if they accept the premises of this bill, that parents who abort children purely because of a Down syndrome diagnosis or a mixed racial baby, that if they acknowledge that that's wrong, then they're acknowledging that all abortions are wrong because it's not as if killing babies because they're black or disabled, it, that, that's not as if that's why abortion's wrong, right? It's not as if only killing disabled babies and black babies in the womb is wrong. No, no. If you acknowledge that it's wrong to kill babies because they're black, the wrong gender, or 
disabled, then you're really acknowledging this wrong to kill all babies because we don't have value because of our skin color or our disabledness. We have value because of our humanity. So you see they're dodging this ideological bullet because it would destroy their worldview and put its bigotry on full display. But Heidi Weinberg, the ACLU of Tennessee executive director, comes out and says, this law is just another unconstitutional effort to ban abortion in our state. It does nothing to address the serious concerns of those with disabilities in our community. Well, no, it does. The serious concern that some babies are killed because they're disabled. So that actually would address the concerns of people with disabilities who still dwell in wombs. She says, or to ensure that people living with disabilities and their families have access to health care and other services they may need. Nor is this bill about addressing discrimination against women and girls or people of color. Uh, yeah, it is a specific type of discrimination, prenatal racist discrimination, which Planned Parenthood has shown through multiple live action investigative reports are willing to accept racially motivated do donations that are earmarked to pay for killing black babies. She says banning certain abortions will not provide a real solution to, to gender or racial discrimination and does nothing to address their root causes. We will continue to fight for people's ability to make their own decisions about pregnancy, blah, 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 blah. OK, so. You know, obviously, she's just trying to dodge every type of um, ideological bullet that this Tennessee legislation represents, because the root cause, which she says this bill does nothing to address, is actually bigotry, right? It's discrimination against unborn children for being smaller, less developed and more dependent. So we actually are addressing the root cause by trying to expose your embrace of bigotry at a root level, which is to say, if you're in a womb, you can be killed for any reason or no reason at all. Now, let's break down the sort of the racial, gender, and eugenics aspect of this legislation, okay? Remember, the left calls us racist, sexist, and ableist. They say that we don't care about discrimination of others based off of their skin color, gender, or disabilities. So let's take some of the premises of the left here, some of the arguments or points that they make in their policy descriptions and worldview, and just see why it doesn't apply to abortion. Assuming the disproportionate African-American incarceration rate is attributed purely to racism, let's just assume that that's what the left says, then how could aborting babies because they're black be okay? <laughs> because isn't killing someone because of their skin color worse than incarcerating someone because of their skin color? <laughs> right? That's what the left said. They said there's disproportionate African-American incarceration rates. And you know why? Racism, systemic racism. Y yeah, but you're pro-abortion. You say it's okay to kill babies even if the mother is seeking to kill that baby because she had a fling with a black man and doesn't want a mixed racially a – ra a racial mixed baby. You say that you won't come out against that. Isn't it worse to kill someone because of their skin color than to incarcerate them because of their skin color? Interesting. Well, let's move on to gender uh, discrimination or sexism. Assuming the gender wage gap can be attributed to pure sexism against women, that's what they say, right? They don't acknowledge any other factors that might contribute to the gender wage gap. They say it's sexism against women. Well, let's assume that's true. Then how could aborting babies because they're female be okay? <laughs> Isn't killing someone because of their gender worse than paying them less because of their gender? Ah, uh, the questions you're not supposed to ask. Now let's move to eugenics or ableism, right? Assuming the disabled and infirm are ignored or denied healthcare purely because of their diagnosis – which is what the left says. And they accuse conservatives of sort of supporting ableism by supporting a free market healthcare system. Assuming that's true, then how could killing people because they're disabled be okay? <laughs> Isn't killing someone because they're disabled far more ableist than denying them healthcare because they're disabled? Of course, of course. But you see, the left has to stick their head fully in the sand, deny the existence of an objective reality in order to avoid the ideological bullet that this Tennessee legislation represents. But we know what the real answer is here, don't we? We all know what the real answer is. The abortion industry and many pro-choice activists don't actually care about racism, sexism, or ableism. Those are just buzzwords that they weaponize in order to attack their political opponents, conservatives and pro-lifers. They don't actually care about these things in real life. If they did, they'd be against abortion, which kills more black babies than every two weeks than the KKK lynched in a century. And we're going to go through more of how they don't really care about these things. So let's see if the left and the pro-abortion movement really care about racism, sexism, or ableism. Well, let's start with racism. Well, Planned Parenthood kills more unarmed black lives in two weeks than the KKK lynched in a century. Planned Parenthood was founded by a racist and eugenicist that spoke at a KKK rally and 
um, Planned Parenthood continues to praise and name awards after that founder, Margaret Sanger. 79% of Planned Parenthood surgical abortion facilities are located within walking distance of majority black neighborhoods because Planned Parenthood in the abortion industry knows that black women of childbearing age represent 4% of the American public, and yet they obtain 36 to 40% of the annual abortion rate. Well, those numbers are very helpful to know if you're trying to maximize your abortions, right? You recognize that that's a disproportionate amount of abortions that are being performed on a very small percentage of the American public. So there's a lot of bang for your buck right there. They recognize that. That's why they put a disproportionate amount of their abortion facilities within walking distance of a racial class that obtains a disproportionate amount of abortions. Planned Parenthood once tweeted, and you can look this up, that if you're a black woman in America, it's statistically safer to have an abortion than to give birth. Wow. What's more racist than that? Pandering to the... <laughs> To a racial class that perform that uh, that gives you the most cash in return for killing their children by telling them, well, if you care about your health, you should just get an abortion because that's safer than giving birth. And Planned Parenthood endo endorsed Joe Biden, who said that you're not black if you don't vote for him, described Obama as the first clean and articulate black man in American politics, and said, quote, unlike the African-American community, with notable exceptions, the Latino community is incredibly diverse, with incredibly diverse attitudes about different things. Wow, sounds pretty racist. I guess the left and the pro-abortion movement doesn't care about racism. They're the organization, along with the left, that's called for canceling anyone that reminds us as Americans of our troubled racial history, while fully endorsing and naming awards after their racist and eugenicist founder who launched the Negro Project in order to create less black people in America. I guess they don't care about racism. Interesting. What about sexism? Well, they tell men that their opinion and entire thoughts on abortion mean nothing because of their genitalia. They tell men to shut up and their opinion on abortion means as much as a cow's opinion, to quote Joey Tribbiani. It's a moo point. It's a moot point. It means nothing. We don't care about your opinion on abortion because you have a penis. Can you imagine if a pro-life man like myself told a pro-choice woke um, activist woman that she doesn't get to have an opinion on 40-year-old men raping 8-year-old boys because that's a male issue? It actually doesn't involve females. Um, how would that be received? I'd probably be labeled a sexist and rightly so. But when they tell that to men who might want to voice their opinions on the slaughter of their own preborn children, they're told to shut up. That would be sexism. What about ableism? Well, Margaret Sanger was an actual eugenicist, right, who hobnobbed with the founders of the American Eugenics Society in America and advocated for a eugenics approach to breeding, which she called, quote, for the gradual suppression elimination, and eventual extinction of defective stocks, those human weeds which threaten the blooming of the finest flowers of American civilization. That's from a piece of writing she wrote called Highlights in the History of Birth Control from October 1923, if you want to look it up. So Margaret Sanger was a eugenicist who wanted to use birth control and specifically encouraging the black community to do so. And even sterilizing infirm individuals who she didn't want reproducing. That would be ableism if anything fit the bill. So obviously the pro-abortion movement and the left doesn't care about racism, sexism, or ableism. And they're not going to condemn abortions which are sought for racial, sexist, or ableist motivations because they don't care about it. They're just buzzwords that they weaponize to attack their political opponents. So we're going to get to more of why the strategy of attempting to ban discriminatory abortions is so effective and important in just one second. But first, if you like this show and want to hear more great content and commentary from the front lines of the pro-life movement and the abortion wars, then consider becoming a patron of the show. Head on over to patreon.com forward slash unaborted and look at our fun different tiers and perks, anywhere from $5 a month up to $300 a month and everything in between. And you'll find some cool uh, perks that you'll get for supporting the show, access to me, conversations together with other patrons, exclusive access to content, downloadable content, et cetera, et cetera, just to kind of provide a fun gift to you as a thank you in return for supporting the show. This enables us to protect, uh, expand our production value, bring on more people, and be able to create different types of content with a film crew on the streets filming interactive content with people on college campuses and in the public square. So if you want to do that, that would mean a lot to us. You'll help us reach more people, but stay tuned. And we'll be right back with a whole lot more. Welcome back to the show. So we're talking about this bill in Tennessee, right, that's going to ban abortions that are sought 
because of the race, gender, or Down syndrome diagnosis of the child. And the interesting thing about this bill is that it trolls the left, right? And and it creates sort of metaphysical schizophrenia because the left who says that they hate sexism, racism, and ableism have to turn around and condone racism, sexism, and ableism if it's being used to justify the killing of preborn human beings. But there's a little bit more as to why the strategy of attempting to ban discriminatory abortions is so important. Because maybe you're listening to this and you're wondering, well, why focus only on banning abortions that are based on sex, race, or disabilities? Why not just ban all abortions, right? Well, unfortunately, personhood bills that outlaw all abortions have never gained sort of the political support necessary to actually become law. We haven't had the political capital or votes needed. Additionally, thanks to the Planned Parenthood v. Casey decision that we talked about earlier in 1992, if state legislation creates an undue burden restricting a woman's access to abortion, then such legislation is automatically deemed unconstitutional. So pro-lifers have always seek to craft legislation and pass legislation that chips away at the abortion behemoth by planting moral premises in the law that in the end will demand respect for all members of the human family, preborn children included. And Robert P. George from Princeton has said this best. He said he once said that planting premises in the law whose logic demands in the end Full respect for all members of the human family can be a valuable thing to do, even where those premises seem modest. Okay, so here's what this means as as it's applied to incremental legislation like the one in Tennessee that at least is now being allowed to be enforced that bans discriminatory abortions. If we can succeed in passing legislation, okay, that makes it illegal to kill unborn babies because they're disabled, black, or not the preferred gender, it becomes much easier to make the obvious case that aborting babies is wrong regardless of the reason one might seek their death. Do you understand? It's not wrong to kill a baby in the womb because they're black or because they're a female or because they're disabled. It's wrong to kill them because they're human, (laughs) right? It just becomes particularly more nasty if you seek their death because of discriminatory reasons. And context is everything, right? Our country is currently absorbed in conversations about racism and discrimination. So in that case, how could we possibly accept the permissibility of discriminatory abortions that target unborn babies for traits they have no control over, right? Their gender, their disability, or their skin color. This is what the left tells us, that we have systemic racism and unconscious bias that discriminates against others because of their skin color. Well, even if that's true, then you should be pro-life because that's the greatest example of systemic discrimination against black babies who have no control over their skin color in the womb. But of course, the left won't acknowledge that seeking to kill babies in the womb because of their skin color is wrong. So the abortion industry and movement's automatic opposition to banning discriminatory abortions like this bill in Tennessee, that is their public endorsement of eugenics and genocide and gender side. That is their endorsement of ableism. They don't care about these things. So we're going to get to a little bit more of this sort of metaphysical schizophrenia in just one second because this will enable you to understand sort of the bipolar nature of abortion rights logic and abortion rights advocates hoping, hopefully, that you'll be able to expose that schizophrenia and usher them back into reality. So we're going to get to more of that in just one second. But first, I want to tell you about an awesome way to make your pro-life voice heard while also supporting pregnancy resource centers that are on the front lines of this fight to save children and love their mothers and fathers. I'm talking about the new sponsor of Unaborted called Be Blessed Baby. Be Blessed Baby is a new company trying to make a difference in the fight for the unborn, something we need more of in every sphere of life. Be Blessed Baby sells pro-life clothing for babies and adults, including some cool masks. If you've got to wear them right now anyways, you might as well rep your pro-life views. It is a unique way to help raise money for pregnancy centers, and the goal of Be Blessed Baby is to help save as many babies as they can from abortion. So to get your apparel now, go to www.beblessedbaby.com. That's beblessedbaby.com and show the world that you are proudly pro-life. Thanks for tuning in. We'll be right back with a whole lot more. Welcome back to the show. So it's not just the pro-abortions reaction to pro-life bills that attempt to ban discriminatory abortions that portray their metaphysical schizophrenia. It's also the response of abortion rights activists and members of the left and their response to miscarriages that expose 
this sort of bipolar nature of their ideology. And we saw this recently, if you recall, with John Legend and Chrissy Teigen. I actually wrote a piece on this on my website about them recently in October, I believe, mourning their miscarriage, mourning the loss of their son who they have already named Jack. But the irony of this whole thing is that both of them have, have made massive contributions to Planned Parenthood financially. And John Legend led the sort of charge within Hollywood last year to boycott Georgia to say we shouldn't do business in Georgia because they're trying to pass pro-life legislation. So it's interesting. I guess I guess only wanted babies matter, right? Abortions for thee, but not for me. Classic rule of the of sort of the political and uh, Hollywood class, our one percent, our betters, who never live according to the philosophies that they pontificate about. Abortions for thee, but not for me. We were told that we needed to mourn the loss of their child, Jack, because they wanted him. But they will fund the dismemberment and murder of other children, actually weeks older than the son that they lost, as long as the mother doesn't want that child. Well, we're seeing this again from Meghan Markle, the Duchess of Sussex. I could care less about British royalty, but of course, she's in the public eye. She's actually originally born in America, um, but married into the royal family. So according to New York Times, Meghan Markle actually wrote a piece, an op-ed on November 25th. And she publicly shares her recent horrific experience and loss of her child through miscarriage. Now, they have a young son already, and so she was pregnant with their second. So we're just going to talk through a little bit of this. So she writes in this piece, after changing his diaper, her, her, her current son, I felt a sharp cramp. I dropped to the floor with him in my arms, humming a lullaby to keep us both home. Calm. The cheerful tune, a stark contrast to my sense that something was not right. I knew as I clutched my firstborn child that I was losing my second. Oh, so it's a child now. Interesting. She says, losing a child means carrying an almost unbearable grief, experienced by many, but talked about by few. In the pain of our loss, my husband and I discovered that in a room of 100 women, 10 to 20 of them will have suffered from miscarriage. So she calls the thing in the womb a child, and then she refers to losing that child if it's wanted, suffering, grief, loss, and pain. Now, this is strange because in May of 2018, Meghan Markle supported Ireland's abortion referendum. You might remember, remember this a couple of years ago. It was quite tragic, actually. Ireland had been a fairly safe country for preborn children, and the abortion rights crazies and activists pushed for abortion on demand and got their wish. So Meghan Markle has publicly supported the legalization of killing children in the womb as long as they're unwanted, but then says that it's traumatic and grievous and she's suffering losing a child who is in her womb. Now, let me be clear. I believe that their child's death is something objectively tragic, but that's because I acknowledge the reality that the child himself has objective value that stands apart from whether his parents want him or not. But the Marcos believe no such thing. If they did, they wouldn't be praising the dismemberment of boys and girls the same age as their son, whom they just lost. So we have undergone miscarriage, my wife and I. So I understand it, but I can make sense of that philosophically. But Meghan Markle praises laws that make it legal to kill children significantly older than the son she lost. Why? I guess because she wants them, right? So I have some questions. I have some questions for Prince Harry and the Duchess of Sussex. If an unborn child is not a human being and has zero rights, why mourn over its death? <laughs> if your grief in losing your unborn baby is real, and I'm sure it is, then wouldn't it follow that the child was worth grieving over? <laughs> but how could the child be worth grieving over unless it was a unique human being with intrinsic dignity? Because we don't grieve over the loss of tumors or tissue mass. That would be quite silly. We only grieve over the loss of something that is worth grieving over, that has intrinsic dignity, value, and worth, that warrants your love, that warrants your emotional energy. But if your unborn baby was a unique human being with intrinsic dignity, Megan, then all unborn babies have that same dignity. In which case, why do you support abortion? <laughs> do you see? So I'm not saying that she shouldn't mourn. Or that it's wrong to mourn. I'm saying it doesn't make sense to mourn given your philosophy, given your ideology. So as far as I can tell, there are two possible explanations to this schizophrenic madness. Right? What's a schizophrenic? Someone that doesn't really live in reality, can't acknowledge or perceive reality for the objective thing that it is. 
So you'll run around praising killing babies in the womb if they're unwanted and then mourn and ask us to mourn with you in losing a child significantly younger than the other children that you praise killing because it's wanted. This schizophrenic insanity. There are two possible explanations for it. Firstly, either Markle believes that her desire for her children magically transformed blobs of tissue who possess no inherent rights into intrinsically valuable human beings. For if Markle didn't desire this child, right, and aborted him instead at the same stage that she lost him, then secular liberals would demand that we celebrate her exercising her reproductive rights, right? And if pro-lifers mourned over her aborted son in my thought experiment, the left would call us insensitive religious bigots who needed to celebrate her reproductive health care, her bodily autonomy. But if she desires the child and loses it accidentally through a miscarriage, then we're told to mourn it. So in that case, this child's death, which we're being encouraged to mourn, would be lauded as feminism if she aborted the child and no more morally significant, significant than removing a polyp. So in short, dead babies should only be mourned when wanted. <laughs> Insanity. So Planned Parenthood naturally piped up to defend this bigotry by pretending to care about the life of Markle's baby while they murder thousands of babies at the same stage of development every month. So Alexis McGill Johnson, who is now the president of Planned Parenthood, you ready for this, this madness? This is what she tweeted in response to Meghan Markle sharing the tragic loss of her child to miscarriage. She said, in this year of loss, we must take care of each other. Sending Meghan Markle love for sharing her grief so courageously and helping to destigmatize the conversation around miscarriages destigmatize the conversation around miscarriages. What she's getting to is she's saying that there's a stigmatizing conversation around losing your child from the result of miscarriage because some people judge you, right? Or maybe you feel like it was your fault or maybe you feel judgment from others because they're saying that maybe you did something wrong, right? Or you didn't, you didn't adequately take care of your body to take care of your child. But this is hilarious coming from the woman who oversees the slaughter of 300,000 baby humans in the womb every year. Maybe you could destigmatize miscarriages by uh, stigmatizing abortions, Alexis McGill Johnson. Maybe by stigmatizing the culture of death that you oversee and profit off of, you could destigmatize miscarriages because people wouldn't have the sort of culture of death mentality in their minds every time a baby dies. Ridiculous. And you remember Planned Parenthood responded to Chrissy Teigen, John Legend's wife, when she shared her miscarriage by saying that they were mourning with her. Unbelievable. Sometimes I think there's a troll running the Twitter account at Planned Parenthood, some schizophrenic maniac. So that's the first sort of explanation to the schizophrenic ma madness is that Markle believes that her desire for her children magically transforms blobs of tissues into intrinsically valuable human beings with inherent rights that suddenly deserve to be mourned. But that doesn't make a lot of sense. Alternatively, Markle believes that no unborn child, including her own, has rights, regardless of whether their parents desire them. So there is no dignity and worth intrinsic to the child's humanity. Therefore, the only reason she mourns is purely selfish. She doesn't mourn the loss of a child that was worth mourning over because she celebrates slaughtering those same children at the same stage of development if they're unwanted. And obviously being wanted or unwanted doesn't confer or remove dignity from you. So the only reason she mourns is purely selfish. She mourns the loss of what their, her non-person mass of skin cells could have been after, I guess, passing through the magical birth canal. She mourns over their desire for children. So in short, it's all about her. The child merely becomes another idol in the celebrity's never-ending pursuit for more. Surely through just attaining a little bit more, I'll be satisfied. So children become idols in their parents' pursuit of happiness. Now, obviously, either explanation is borderline insane, right? Because human beings don't gain or lose their right to life based on whether others desire them or not. Only an abortionist or someone filled with an evil spirit would actually argue that the 40-week unborn human prior to being pushed out of the birth canal has no rights, but gains them the second their final limb exits the vaginal canal. This is all insanity. But this is what happens when you become addicted to ideology. It causes metaphysical schizophrenia. Because we all know the dirty secret and answer here, don't we? We all know the answer. Meghan Markle wanted her baby, right? This is the bigotry of wanted 
and unwanted. Wanted babies lost to miscarriage deserve to be mourned, I guess. But unwanted babies lost to abortion are trash and will be treated as such. So why this schizophrenic treatment of the unborn? Obviously, it's a bipolar response. It makes no sense. But why? Because of the left's view on human nature. We've talked about this before, right? The left believes that there is no such thing as an objective human nature that holds across time and space. So if there's no such thing as an objective human nature, there are no objective rights that hold across time and space either. There are no objective rights that flow from your human nature because your human nature is endlessly malleable in the view of the left. You can just tinker with it. For how could human rights objectively exist where a human nature doesn't? You'd have to have an objective human nature before you could have objective human rights, if that makes sense. So because the left doesn't believe in an objective human nature, they believe that human nature is socially constructed, right? It depends upon the context and time in history that you live and, and how the majority sort of defines human nature. Therefore, the rights of human beings are socially constructed as well and vary according to the vagaries of culture. So therefore, human beings in the view of the left are not endowed with dignity or rights. They don't have these rights in virtue of their human nature. They're not given by God, as our founding documents say. They're not inalienable. No, no, they're, they're rather conferred upon you by society. Society defines human nature and society determines which rights you will receive or not. So if you're deemed, ready, essential <laughs> or wanted by society in your political class, then you have rights. And if not, you don't, right? So if Meghan and her husband, Prince Harry, the Duke of Sussex, confer value and dignity upon their child through their desire for him, then voila, he has value. <laughs> he has rights now because it's been conferred upon him by society, man, by his parents, who define their own version of reality, right? According to the Planned Parenthood v. Casey decision, at the heart of liberty is our right to define the mystery of human life. It's up to us. So we can just tinker with human nature to make it fit our liking and our preferences. But if another woman does not desire her unborn offspring and arranges to have him murdered, then Megan would applaud her choice. Yay! See, because you didn't confer dignity and value on the child. But wait, the schizophrenia gets worse. What if a conservative like myself responds to this leftist and says, well, wait a second. If we can just define unborn human beings out of existence based on whether we desire them or not, then why not apply that reasoning out of utero as well? Out of the womb. What if I decide that pro-choicers are non-essential and unwanted? Can I kill them? <laughs> of course not. And the leftist, right? The progressive, the pro-choice advocate will say, no, of course not, you silly conservative. That's why we have laws, <laughs> right? That's why we have laws. Listen, this is the judicial philosophy of the left. It's a view called positive law, and it suggests that rights come from government. And they have to come from government if what? If there's not an objective human nature that holds across time and space and rights that spring from that human nature. Rights given to you by God that are inalienable and cannot be taken from you, right? So if you can just endlessly tinker with human nature and there's no rights that flow from an objective human nature, then who decides which rights we have or not? The government. This is the view of positive law. So the schizophrenia becomes hilarious here because the woke leftist won't accept killing them if they're unwanted by a conservative, but they will accept killing unborn human beings who are unwanted by their parents. So they don't even apply their ideology or their philosophy or their justifications for killing human beings consistently. So they'll say, well, that's why we have laws, you silly conservative, right? The laws that protect me from being unjustly killed, but don't protect the unborn from being unjustly killed. Now, notice they don't reject our appeal to wanted or unwanted to mistreat them simply because they have objective rights that flow from an objective human nature. Most leftists will not appeal to their own humanity or human nature as the source of their rights. They'll appeal to government. 
So they reject our out of utero application of their pro-choice arguments because the courts have rejected the personhood and rights of the unborn, but recognize the personhood and rights of the born human. OK, now, where does this become problematic? OK, he, he, look, we're going to sort of reduct you ad absurdum this. OK, we're going to expose the metaphysical schizophrenia here. The problem with grounding your rights in the government or the courts is this. If rights come from government, then the abortion advocate can't really complain if the state does not permit her an abortion, right? For the same government that grants rights can take them away. However, if they then pivot and say abortion is a natural right, one that springs from our human nature, then the abortion advocate had that right from the moment she began to exist, the moment of conception. Because if natural rights spring from our human nature, then we have them from the moment we're human. And when is the moment we're human? The moment of conception. So if the woke progressive tries to ground the right to abortion as a natural right, then he's saying that women have the fundamental natural right to an abortion from the moment they begin to exist, the moment of abortion. <laughs> and according to Hadley Arcs, he points out that we are left with an amusing paradox. According to the logic of abortion advocates, Unborn women do not have a right to life, but they do have a right to an abortion. <laughs> That's where that l silly schizophrenic logic leads, is saying that unborn women in the womb don't have a right to life, but they do have a right to abort their offspring, even though they're still a fetus in the womb with a reproductive system. <laughs> now, this is ridiculous, right? Because how could human rights exist where the right to life doesn't? If you don't get the right to life right, you won't get any other rights right. So we're once again left with the schizophrenia of abortion rights arguments. If abortion is a positive right, then it can be justly taken away. But abortion rights act advocates claim that it cannot be taken away. So if it's a natural right, then that right exists from the moment we exist conception. Now, schizophrenics cannot accurately recognize or live in reality. That's what makes someone schizophrenic, right? So in this debate, the left's overdose on ideology has turned them into metaphysical schizophrenics. This is why pro-life Christians must speak out on issues like abortion and expose the illogic and insanity of the pro-abortion worldview. We don't do it to shame them. We don't do it to condemn them. We don't do it to justify calling them metaphysical schizophrenics. We do it out of compassion. We do it to hopefully win them back to reality by exposing the insanity of their worldview. Nancy Piercy put this incredibly once. She said that Christians should speak out on moral issues, not because they feel offended or because their sacred beliefs are threatened, but rather because they have compassion for those who were trapped by destructive ideas. And as long as we continue to accept the premises of abortion on demand and the premises that make it plausible in the first place, namely that not all human beings are created equal, we are also putting in place the premises that will justify our own enslavement. For if we can kill unborn human beings for differing from us in certain ways, why can't we kill born people? Because they differ from us in certain ways and we create new categories and checkboxes that must be meet, met to have value. That's why we care about exposing the schizophrenia of the abortion rights logic is because we want to win them back to reality and free them from the, the, the destructive ideas that they're trapped in. So this leads us to the great conservative consolation, if you will. And we'll end with this. The great conservative consolation is that reality always reasserts itself in the end, because at the end of the day, reality tends to be self-evident. Most people can acknowledge and recognize reality for the thing that it is. It's only those who are sort of living in echo chambers or addicted to partisanship and confirmation bias that end up blinding themselves from reality. So we must expose that reality, bring it into the public square, and we do that by exposing the absurdity of these arguments. Schizophrenia is a state of mind which prevents normal perception of reality. But what we often fail to realize is that we can actually drive ourselves insane by embracing ideas grounded in fantasy. By ignoring the reality in favor of ideology, we enter strange territory where good is bad and bad is good, where killing babies through abortion is to be celebrated, but losing babies through miscarriage is tragic. Where calling an unborn baby a baby is pro-life rhetoric. But when leftist celebrities get pregnant, they don't hesitate to call their baby baby or little guy. 
Reality can be ruthless, though, and he will come home to roost. Reality demands to be acknowledged. And when he does, and our face is left stinging from his slap, we would do well to abandon ideology and fantasy and return to reality. I do believe the Markles have a right to mourn. I do believe that they are right to mourn. I believe that is the normal response to losing a baby to miscarriage. But only reality can make sense of that response. And that reality is quite simple, isn't it? Every human being has intrinsic dignity and value simply because they are human. We mourn the loss of our unborn children because they are human, not because they're partially human, not because they're potentially human, but because they are fully human from the moment of conception. They're just a little smaller, a little less developed, and a little more dependent. But don't we all differ from one another in the same ways? Shouldn't we adopt a greater obligation to care for the smaller, the less developed, and the more dependent among us? If we do, I think we'll find that reality is a much more rewarding place to live in. In fact, it's the only place worth living in. And I invite Meghan Markle and her husband to meet me there and to turn the other cheek to reality. Well, that's all we have time for for today. Thanks for joining me. Head on over to iTunes, YouTube, Spotify. Give the show a rating and review. And actually, go to YouTube and subscribe if you would do me that favor and uh, sort of uh, click the notifications bell. We want to have more people engaging with our content visually as we often include visuals and reaching a lot of young people who are shaped through a secular liturgy on YouTube. So do that for us. If you want to learn more and engage with me online, head on over to sethgruber.com, S-E-T-H-G-R-U-B as in baby boy, E-R.com to sign up for my newsletter, to view my speaking schedule, and to get training videos to equip you to defend life. Thanks for tuning in. Until next week, I'm Seth Gruber, and this is Unaborted.